Well, hello, folks. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church's Weekend Worship Online. We are so glad that you're joining with us today, and we hope that this comes at the end of a great week for you. We hope you've seen God's hand at work in your midst. We hope that God's used you uh, this past week. Uh, for myself, it's been an interesting week because, well, I'm an L.A. sports fan, and it's not been a great week uh, for sports things in L.A. The Dodgers have had some <laughs> very strange things going on uh, in their life. Uh, but what I'm really thinking about is the Lakers. Um, they got knocked out of the playoffs in four games. They got beat by the Denver Nuggets. And um, a surprise to some that they got knocked out, certainly that they got knocked out in four games because they've got LeBron James. And this guy is a superstar, one of the best players that has ever played the game. But one of the differences is that the Lakers, while well, they've got LeBron and um, a few other good players, it kind of all focuses on him. Whereas the Nuggets, they've got a few standout, a couple anyway, a good standout players, but they've got a great team. They've got a wonderful bench, a good support. And as I was watching it, it made me think a little bit about how the church is supposed to operate. You see, uh, we are all that God would want us to be when we are uh, working at our entirety, when everyone's doing that which God has placed them in the role to be, whether, as Scripture talks about, as being a, a, the body of Christ. So some of us are a hand, some of us are a foot, some of us are an ear, some of us are a nose, and it's only when the entire body comes together that it's what we should be. You can have a great pastor, you can have a great uh, choir director, you can have a great council president, uh, you can have great individuals, but if the rest of the body isn't coming and doing what it's supposed to do, then the church will always fall short. So, uh, learn from the L.A. Lakers, Calvary Baptist Church. Um, uh, may we be all that God desires us to be uh, this day and every day. We're going to move into our worship this morning. Uh, we're going to start off with a great song, All Because of Jesus, and it really is all because of him. May it not only be a catchy tune that gets our, our, uh, our minds and, and, and energy flowing, but may it be a truth that resonates with our hearts as well.
Okay, fast beat, great music. Um, hopefully if you were dozing when you started, that's got you awake and alert now. Um, as we move into a season of prayer, a time of great privilege and opportunity for us as God's people uh, to not only uh, bring before God our struggles, our joys, but uh, maybe even more importantly, the struggles and joys of our brothers and sisters in the faith. So uh, would you bow with me as we spend just a few moments in prayer this day? Father, how we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you that we're able to do this on a weekly basis, but as followers of yours, we thank you so much more that we can do this on a day by day or hour by hour or minute by minute basis because you're always available to us, Lord. Wherever we find ourselves, whatever circumstances we're in the midst of, God, we can commune and connect with you. And what a, a wondrous um, privilege, right, uh, opportunity, blessing that you have granted to us. Lord, in addition to the things that are going on in our own lives, which we are normally pretty good about bringing before you, we want to pause this day to think of some of the things uh, that are just going on around us. Uh, Father, we uh, think of um, just some of those that are struggling with illnesses in our church, and it's hay fever season, and other people are dealing with issues like bronchitis and so forth. And, and so for all of those that are struggling um, health-wise, we pray that you would be with them. Lord, we continue to pray for Amy as she recovers from her broken foot and for Tony as he re is rebounding from uh, the knee replacement. May you watch over them and may you grant to all of those, Lord, um, in need of your physical touch, strength and healing this day and in the days ahead. Father, we think of some uh, students that we've had the privilege of having some interaction with at Chemeketa and um, God, as we've been able to provide some scholarship assistance and just come alongside them, I'm um, in a uh, source of encouragement and prayer. We do want to remember them before you. And so we, we think this day of uh, Montserrat and of Alexander, of uh, Jocelyn and of uh, Magale, and just ask God that you would be with them uh, in a variety of ways, that you would be with them as they continue on in, um, Lord, their studies, um, moving into a second year, you're here before too long. We pray that you would be with them, Lord, uh, in their relationship with you. God, we know that um, while the studies are important, nothing is more significant than growing and deepening their walk with you. And so we ask that you would help them in that. And then we pray, Lord, that you would surround them with those that can be a source of encouragement to them as they take this step to move forward, Lord, and in their knowledge of, of your world. May that uh, serve as a basis, God, for some wonderful things that you have ahead for them. Beyond our uh, area, Lord, we think of uh, Sudan and Ukraine and continue to pray for peace in those places where uh, warfare and destruction at the moment reigns. We ask that that would be replaced, Lord, instead um, by um, clear thinking and a recognition that um, what everyone is striving for is not going to be accomplished uh, at the end of a, of a gun barrel, but Lord, um, only as people talk and share and relate. And I pray, Lord, would, would invite you to be a part of that process. So watch over uh, the people in those lands. And then as we find ourselves in Memorial Day weekend, God, we think of our own nation and of those that have paid the ultimate price in order that we can enjoy the privileges that we have whether it's uh, worshiping you or uh, being able to share those things that are on our hearts and minds uh, with uh, free speech. God, for so many of the, the blessings we enjoy here, it's because someone else paid a price. And so, uh, God, for those um, that struggle this day because it reminds them of the loss of a loved one, whether it be a, a parent or a sibling, a father, maybe a spouse or um, as some other close friend. May you be for them a special source of comfort. For us as a nation, God, we pray that um, this day would help to remind us that those things that we enjoy have come at a cost um, and not to take those things for granted. And so uh, may this be a, a time in which we can recall those just as, Lord, as followers of yours, we are reminded that what we enjoy um, 
in our relationship, our walk with you, at the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, all of that comes because someone else paid a price for us, and that is your son, Jesus. So thank you for that. God, be with us now as we look to your word. Open our hearts and minds to all that you would want to reveal. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, great time for us to look to God's Word. So grab your Bibles or your Bible app or whatever it is that you use today. We're continuing on in our wonderful series on the book of Exodus. Um, we're going to be looking at chapters 3 and 4 uh, today. Now, I, I know that I did the first two out of order, fit with our Mother's Day emphasis, but we'll try to get back in the right sync of things today. But as we move into our sermon time, I just want to ask you the question, have you ever found yourself in a situation where, where you've just sort of been in over your head? Um, maybe the, uh, the task that was assigned to you ended up being bigger than you anticipated, or, or maybe you just feel um, uh, inadequate for, uh, for the role you've been placed in. Uh, maybe it's a, a situation where uh, you just don't feel like you're quite the right person for whatever reason, or there's not sufficient time. But, but whatever it is, you, you just sort of feel overwhelmed by, by where you find yourself. Well, if you've been in that place, and I think just about every one of us have, uh, then you are in good company because uh, the person we're going to be focusing on today has shared a very similar experience, that person being Moses. Uh, as we've uh, Move, as we move into this third chapter today, of course, we looked at the first two and uh, the latter part of that second chapter, just to give us a little bit of context, you might be reminded that, um, that uh, Pharaoh, who was born a Hebrew, uh, as you may remember previously, but was adopted into the, uh, the Pharaoh's household, grew up in, in Pharaoh's palace. Uh, he was out one day and saw a fellow Hebrew slave uh, that was being beaten. He uh, let this temper get the best of him. He killed the Egyptian um, that was beating the slave. Unfortunately, he was seen doing that, and so he ends up having to flee uh, to get out of town um, and ends up in a land called Midian. And, and with that as kind of the, the background for us, uh, what we find ourselves is in a situation where um, I think we can feel a little bit for, for Moses and what he's going through because he, he ends up having this an encounter with God in, in which God asked him to do some pretty um, unique and challenging things. Imagine, for example, that um, you were having a conversation with God and God told you to go back uh, to a place where you were a wanted man or a wanted woman. Oh, and, and uh, while you're there, you need to confront the most powerful person on the face of the earth and tell them that you want to take all of their labor away. Uh, in the case of the, uh, the Hebrew people, it was the three million slaves who were under uh, Pharaoh's oversight. Oh, and then in addition to that, um, that you're supposed to lead those slaves out into the wilderness for hundreds of miles into a place you've never been before. Oh, and then in addition to that, you're supposed to do that as an octogenarian. Um, the poor uh, Moses is 80 years old at this point. And as we, we think about these circumstances, I think we can uh, sympathize at least a little bit with Moses on, on what it is that God had placed before him. And so it's no wonder, as we uh, move into our text in just a moment, as, as Moses has had that uh, burning bush encounter with God, that we can see why there were some questions that he probably had to ask. There was even an objection that he had. And, and then, in addition to that, there was some advice that he wanted to offer God. And, and as we spend some time today, we're going to see how those things uh, were uh, dealt with by God. He really didn't mind the questions, didn't even mind the objection, wasn't really excited, God, um, by the advice that um, Moses had to offer. But let's take some time and look at that today as we dive into our text, which is found in uh, Exodus, the third chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14 to begin with. We're going to do a lot of reading today, uh, so keep your fingers there, but I think it'll be important for us to, uh, to be able to move forward in what God would reveal to us. So we start here with Exodus, the third chapter, beginning with verse 1, where we read this. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, also known as Sinai. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, 
I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses. Moses, God said, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And this is the first time we see that reference in Scripture of referring to a place as holy ground. Then God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, well, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, well, what's his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Then skip over to the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 1. Moses answered, but what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So he reached out and took hold of the snake and then turned it back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to them. Then going down to verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will help you speak, and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, O Lord, please send someone else to do it. And then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he can speak well, and he is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. As we look to this, we're reminded of what it is that uh, Moses has found himself in. He's in this situation where he's in this strange place called Midian. Um, but even in that setting, God has been at work in his life. What he's been is actually in the training, though he didn't realize it. And, and what had been happening is God had taken Moses, placed him in this place where for, for 40 years he tends sheep in the wilderness in order to prepare him that he might be in a position to uh, go and spend 40 years tending sheep, God's sheep, uh, the Hebrews, in the wilderness. Gave him just the uh, kind of background he needed for what it was that was ahead of him. And he did that as he uh, was there under the, the kind of the direction and the counsel and the leading of his father-in-law, Jethro. Uh, not this Jethro, um, but uh, the, the Jethro who was the, the priest there in Midian. In fact, we, we know that the name Jethro is probably a title, um, meant excellency, because his real name, Ruel, is given to us in the second chapter in the 18th verse. And out of this setting, we, we find that, that Moses has this conversation with God, and he asks him three questions to begin with. The first one of those questions is a question to, to help him get clarity on, on what it is and he's supposed to do. 
Now remember, uh, Moses has found himself in, in the midst of this kind of out of the blue. It wasn't like Mary and Joseph where they had an angelic visitor who warned them what was coming. Moses is just sort of catching this all uh, afresh, uh, unexpectedly. And so he has, uh, not surprisingly, these questions. And the first one is, who am I? In uh, Exodus 3.11, it says this. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? What, what status do I have? What kind of significance am, 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 is representative of me that would allow me to do this? And it's interesting as we, we look to see to God's response, um, <clears throat> not only what God says, but what God doesn't say. You know, sometimes I, I think we gain great insights, not only from what's said, but what's not said in particular settings. And in this particular setting, what we see is that God didn't say anything to Moses about Moses. He just sort of moves in, in a different direction. In, in essence, what he's saying is that, Moses, you've got this all wrong. It's not about who you are, but it's about who I am. What's important is that I am in you. And that's what the response was that God gave to Moses. The first answer to that first question was, I will be with you. I will be with you. And that's what will enable you to do great things. Not because you're great, but because I'm great and I'm going to be right there beside you. And I think one of the things we can take from this is that recognition, um, that understanding that when we find ourselves lacking confidence to properly represent God or, or, or feel maybe a, a little uncertain about doing the task that he's called us to, that we need to remember that God doesn't send us out there uh, uh, on our own. He sends us uh, as individuals who go with him and he with us. And we see examples of that in numerous places in Scripture. For example, in Matthew, the 10th chapter, Jesus talking here to the, the apostles about that time that will come um, after he's gone. He says, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Uh, Paul echoes this same understanding in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, when he says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. That's what we are, just vessels of God. And jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So uh, Moses asked the question, who am I? And God says, that's not what's important. What's important is, is who I am and that I'll be with you. Then he moves into the second question, and he kind of says, well, who are you? Who is, who is God? And he words it in this way. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This is the first time in Scripture that God really gives his proper name, and that was a little bit unusual. People guarded their names a, a little bit in, in those particular days and ages. And, and so we see there's something special about this. And In fact, for Orthodox Jews yet today, um, they consider this name so special, so unique, so holy, so sacred, that they actually won't say the name of God. Uh, they simply call him Adonai, which means Lord, or sometimes they refer to him as Hashem, which means the name. In fact, when, when Orthodox Jews are writing out uh, the, the name of God or making reference, they'll sometimes put G-D because they, uh, they just don't feel worthy to be able to, to speak or, or name God like that. And this is important not only for us to, to understand the interaction between Moses and God here, but, but also as it gives us a, a better uh, clarity on Jesus uh, later on. You know, uh, there are individuals who say that Jesus never said that he was God, and that couldn't be further from the truth. If we go to the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter, we read of some conversation that's taking place there where individuals are criticizing and challenging Jesus. And listen to how Jesus responds in, in three distinct verses in that 8th chapter, in the, the 24th and the 28th and the 58th verse. Jesus says this, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am. And then your Bible, if you're NIV, which is what I'm using, your Bible says that I am he, but in the Greek, he isn't there. Jesus' full response is, if you do not believe that I am. 
Um, go to verse 28. Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And again, you'll see the word he not there in the Greek. Jesus is saying, then you will know that I am. And we go down to the 58th verse. And very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Three times in just one chapter, Jesus is saying very clearly, he is God, which is why the, uh, the, the Hebrew people got so upset. It's why the individuals in Jerusalem were so uh, frustrated and, and even furious with Jesus, why they set out to try to kill him because they accused him of blasphemy. But Jesus could not have been clear, and they clearly understood that. Jesus was declaring his identity as God but let's um, go back to our, our text for today. So we've answered the, uh, the question of um, who am I? Who are you, God? And then he moves into the third question. What if it, no one believes me, Lord? What am I to do if no one uh, believes that you have sent me? And the, the text words it in this way. Moses answered, what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that that's in your hand? A staff, Moses replied. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Uh, what was it that, that Moses had there? Well, he had a staff. And why did he have a staff? Well, remember, he's in the wilderness. He's a shepherd. That's what shepherds carried around in the wilderness. He had a staff. It was a, a normal everyday object for him. It's what shepherds just typically uh, took with them. In our day and age, it would be a different kind of situation. So if we were to have this encounter today, God would probably say, throw down your keys or throw down your cell phone or throw down your Starbucks card and I'll, I'll turn it into a snake. But in Moses' day, everybody had a staff if you were a shepherd. That's just what you took. And what God is saying here is that I just want you to use the things that are available to you that are part of who you are. You don't have to do something special. You don't have to become somebody other than who you are. Just take what I've already given you or what's already available and use those things. And we see examples of that so many times in Scripture. For David, his, his staff was a sling. That's what younger shepherds would, would take along to protect the flocks. In Samson's case, his staff was the, the jawbone of a donkey, which he used to, to kill a thousand Philistines. When Jesus was with the young boy, the young boy's staff was two fish and some loaves of bread, which he then used to feed thousands. For some of you uh, listening to this, your staff is, is uh, maybe your professional skills, or your staff might be um, the interpersonal strengths that you have, or, or maybe your experience, or your personality, or your unique talents. Maybe your, your staff is, is the gift of time that you have at this stage of life. You know, as I was thinking about myself in regards to this, um, I, I got thinking uh, that, that really kind of I am uh, the staff that that's God has given to me. Because as I, I look at my life and, and see what God has made of me, I, I really would probably describe myself at this particular time as kind of a spiritual mongrel. Um, a pastoral mongrel. Think of me uh, uh, that way. You, you see the picture there and you see this, this unique dog that's there. It's a, a multitude of different breeds. And that's what a mongrel is. It's got a little bit of everything that's in there. And that's sort of how God has, I think, put me together. When I was starting off ministry, I would go to seminars or to conferences or to workshops, and I hear these great men and women who were extraordinary preachers or teach biblical teachers or, or maybe great counselors or evangelists. And I would think, boy, I would love to be like those people. And so I'd buy their books and I'd get their courses and I'd go through the stuff and I, I'd try to do that. And undoubtedly, it, it helped me be better in, in my uh, role as a pastor. But after a few years, it became readily apparent to me that I was never going to be like those folks. I was never going to be a, a John MacArthur quality of preacher. But you know what? I don't think I'm too bad at it. I don't think it's too painful uh, for you to listen to every week. I was never going to be a Chuck Swindoll quality of, of, of Bible teacher, but I've never had anybody walk out uh, of a Sunday school class that I was teaching. I'm never going to be a Billy Graham kind of person when it comes to evangelism, but God has allowed me on occasion um, to be used by him to, to bring people into a relationship with him. I'm never going to be a Mother Teresa kind of person in providing comfort, and yet I think people find a sense of reassurance when I pray for them when I'm in the hospital. I'm not extraordinary in any of those things, but I do a lot of things okay. 
And that's my staff. That's who God has created me to be. And it took a while, but I finally reached that place where I could be at peace with that. Recognizing I wasn't going to be exceptional in anything, but I was going to be okay in a lot of things. That's my staff. What's your staff? I think God wants us to know that and then, and then to use that. Paul kind of gives reference to that in, in 1 Corinthians 3 when he says, I, speaking as Paul, planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God's made it grow. God's the one that, that ultimately brings about the, the change that needs to happen there. But in this case, Paul was a, uh, was a planter. Apollos was a waterer. What is your staff as you think about this? So Moses asks these three questions, God answers him, and then he, he moves into an objection. And God is actually pretty gracious about that. In the fourth chapter, the 10th verse, it says, Moses said to the Lord, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And then in the 12th verse, God said, now, now go and I will help you speak and teach you what to say. The, the phrase here, uh, a slow in speech and tongue, literally means heavy in mouth and tongue. And we don't know exactly what it means. Um, it may have meant that, that Moses had a, a speech impediment. Maybe he was a stutterer. Uh, maybe he had a cliff palate. Cliff palate. Some people have thought that that's the case. But that's not what the, the main idea, that's what, what God is driving at here. The, the main idea is that Moses doesn't feel adequate to be used by God. And God said, you're missing it. That's not, not what matters. Moses, you don't get it. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And that's not something I came up with. I can't take credit for it, but I, I love the truth of it. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And so if God's called you into something, and he calls all of us into something, he'll give you the skills, the abilities, whatever is needed to be able to accomplish that. So we've had three questions, we've had an objection, and then we move into the last thing. Uh, Moses wants to offer God some advice here, and this is what he has to say in the 13th verse. But Moses said, after all of this, oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. That's his advice. Don't use me, use someone else. And at this point, Moses has crossed a line. Uh, God's been pretty tolerant, pretty understanding up to this point, but at this moment, uh, God's anger burns against him, and the text tells us, because what Moses has done is he's challenged God. He said that, that God has made a mistake. He, he's impugned the character and judgment of God, and God does not like that. Why? Well, because God doesn't make mistakes. What we see throughout scriptures is that God can use the most unlikely people to do the most extraordinary things. It's really, if you look through the entirety of biblical characters, a, a very um, sparse group that, that had any kind of special uh, spiritual qualifications. Most of them were just very ordinary people that God took and placed in unusual circumstances and, and drew out their, their talents or abilities as they leaned on him. So think of Moses or David or Joseph or Mary or Peter or Matthew. I mean, just think about the story for today. If you think you're unqualified or unworthy, think about Moses, an 80-year-old shepherd who has a criminal record and a speech impediment. If God can use a guy like him, do you not think he can use someone like you? And it's interesting, as, as we listen to, 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 to uh, the advice that Moses is giving here, the response is what so many Christians uh, respond to God when they're asked today. So God says, I want you to witness to your friend. And what do we say? We say, well... God send somebody else. Or God says, I, I want you to, to, to serve as a volunteer in children's ministry. And what do we say? Ah, God, uh, find someone else. Or God says, I want you to serve on church council. And we say, oh, Lord, send someone else. Or God says, I want you to go on a missions trip to, to St. Thomas. And we say, okay, God, now you got my attention. <laughs> Obviously, if it, if it involves the word saint, then you, yeah, it must be something that's of you. So if you send me to a place that's got saint in the title, I am your man. I'm going to go. I'm willing to go along. And so God says, good. I want you to go to St. Paul, Minneapolis. And I want you to go in the winter. God has a sense of humor too, you know. Uh, folks, what we find in, in all of this is that God doesn't make mistakes. If he's called you, then you're the right person. And he'll give you everything that you need to accomplish what it is that he's called you to do. Why did God get angry at Moses in this setting? Because he'd impugned the character and judgment of God. And again, God never makes 
mistakes. He could even call an 80-year-old shepherd who was a palace dropout with a criminal record to do something extraordinary, and he did. And when God calls us, he, he, he sort of does the, the same kind of thing. He, he calls us to represent him to the world. We, we read in 2 Corinthians 5 these words, We are therefore Christ ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Because that's what he's doing. He's using our presence, our, our encouragement, maybe our words to, to demonstrate to the world, to show to the world that there's something so wonderfully different uh, than what the world presents. When God calls us, uh, hopefully we will learn uh, from the lessons of Moses and not repeat his mistakes. We won't have to run through all the questions. We won't have to run through the objections. We won't have to offer God advice. Instead, may we, as we read in Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let our light shine before others that we may see his, God's good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Folks, may that be the cry of our heart. May that be the desire of our soul. And may that be true this day and every day. Amen. When it's all been said and done There is just one thing that matters Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? When it's all been said and done My treasures will mean nothing Only what I've done for love's reward Will stand the test of time mercy is so great that you look beyond our weakness and find purest gold in my clay, turning sinners into saints hallelujah and I will always sing your praise on earth and ever after for you've shown me heavens my true home when it's all been said and done you're my life when life is gone Okay, a great song to, uh, to remind us um, that when everything's said and done, God's the one that we look to. God's the one that we trust in. God's the one in whom we place our hope.
Um, we're going to get ready toward wrapping things up, but before we do that, we want to show you one more video. It's a video that just sort of brings to heart and mind uh, one more time uh, what th this weekend is leading us into with Monday being Memorial Day. You know, as, as a nation, we are so grateful for all of our veterans, and, and thank you to all of you who have served our country in that way. But there's a unique group who have been called to pay the ultimate sacrifice to give of their life. And we want to remember those. Um, there was the big saying around, um, you know, the, the falling of the, the towers, we'll never forget. Well, we should never forget any of these people that have made that sacrifice. And so I'll watch the video, and then when that's concluded, I'll close this in a word of prayer. All right, hopefully that um, helped bring to mind one more time um, one of the blessings, one of the things that we're grateful as Americans. We're going to wrap up in a final word of prayer. Before I move into that, just let me say thank you again uh, for joining with us this day. Um, I hope that the truths uh, that you've learned about in, in God's word, the lessons Moses uh, learned, can be ones that we learn as well, and that we can apply those things in our lives, realize that God doesn't make mistakes. That means if he's called us, and he has called us, um, that he's given us everything that we need, that he'll be there beside us, um, and that it's as we come together, each doing our own unique uh, thing, our, our fulfilling our own unique role, uh, that we become all that the church, oh, God would have the church to be. Uh, if you'll bow with me, we'll wrap up in a final word of prayer. Let's pray today. Father, we thank you for this service and uh, Lord, just for this time that we can be together. As we are going to go our own separate ways here in just a moment, um, whatever uh, later this day holds, or maybe it's afternoon, maybe it's morning, depending on uh, when those are watching it. But whatever it is, Father, we pray that in this coming week that you would use us. Father, we know that you're uh, the one who's the head of the church of which we are a part. We know that you never make mistakes. We know that you've given us a role and responsibility um, in the work that you've placed for your church to have here on this earth. So help us in that. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Help us to keep our voice, our ears attuned to your voice so that as you direct, as you lead, as you prompt, as you guide, God, we can respond accordingly. That we can, Lord, be all that you would desire us to be. Father, again, we thank you for um, those who have served our nation in particular for those who have paid the ultimate price, be with family and friend um, who will be remembering uh, on Monday. And we thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.